And something that I've done for a number of years throughout my, my playing days and just throughout my professional career, uh, I've looked into diet and nutrition, how that affects health and chronic disease and athletic performance. And I've come to different sort of conclusions that many here uh, may know of for people that don't. Uh, I do advocate for a uh, species specific, biologically appropriate diet for our species. All animals have a species specific diet, something that they eat specifically. And uh, we are no different. And so it's very important to identify what that is. And I think all the best evidence shows that that is actually a carnivorous diet, eating mostly, if not exclusively, fatty meat. And that's what people have been doing since the dawn of humanity. And whatever you've been doing forever, that is what you're used to doing. That's what you're biologically adapted to doing because that's how nature works. If you're not adapted, if you're not biologically evolved to eat a certain way, you're going to die. You're not going to make it. It's survival of the fittest. And so whether or not we were adapted to this way of eating two million, three million years ago, after two to three million years, we damn well are now. And so anyone's saying that, no, 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 actually eating something that didn't exist 50 years ago, that's what you need to do. Uh, you, can, you can just write them off as a lunatic. So uh, meat has always provided essential nutrients, right? So this, this is something that we require, okay? How do we know this? Well, the Inuit exist, right? There are no plants in the Arctic Circle. There are no plants during an ice age in an Arctic Circle. What plants were available for the people who crossed the land bridge from Asia to North America during the last ice age? There were none. So obviously, if you can't get everything that you need in the proportion that you need them from meat, then you can't survive. You can't live generationally, and we don't exist. We don't, we're not here right now. None of our ancestors would have made it through the, the, the numerous uh, ice ages, and the Inuits wouldn't exist right now, but they do. And many other examples of, of humanity do, like the Maasai there. And so <clears throat> animal-based diets, but they provide the nutrients. We're evolved, we're biologically designed to eat these things, and, uh, and there are a number of different examples of that. Uh, a number of different s people, such as the Inuit, such as the Maasai, such as the Nanette, the Native Australians, these people all have, are well documented to be eating a lot of meat and they would know which plants to eat, maybe used medicinally or if they were at a point of starvation. And so a lot of people will say, well, they had access to these things, sometimes they ate them, therefore they were eating them all the time. Well, you can't say that about the Inuit because they just never had them. So it's always a good example, always good to think about the, the Inuit or the Nanette or people living during an ice age. And one of the main things is they did not have chronic disease at all. So there are a number of accounts going back hundreds of years that found that these, these populations did not get the so-called diseases of the West. And that's what they had to call them because only people in Western countries were getting these diseases. These people were not. Now, since they've been incorporated into Western society, they're eating more Western food, Western alcohol, Western sugar, Western seed oils, they're getting Western diseases, right? Now we just call them getting older, right? Plant-based diets, these are sort of in vogue, hopefully not for much longer, but they are missing many essential nutrients, B12, D3, K2, retinol, which is vitamin A, DHA, EPA, we touched on those, those are the essential omega-3s that you have to have, that you cannot get from plants and we don't really make them well ourselves. We need them from the food that we eat. Retinol, vitamin A, people think, well, what about beta carotene? Can't you turn that into vitamin A? Yeah, but only 55% of people can. Fully 45% of human beings cannot convert beta carotene into retinol. They have to get it from meat. You can't get it from anywhere else. So what does that mean? That means we have to eat meat, right? We have to eat it to get B12 too. That doesn't exist. D3 doesn't exist. Well, vitamin K. We get that from kale, right? Vitamin kale, no. <laughs> kale has K1, and just like ALA, that's an omega-3, but it's not the right omega-3. K1 is not the right uh, vitamin K. We need K2, and we can't really convert K1 into K2, so we need it again from our meat. So any nutritionist, and this is sort of the crux of this discussion, any nutritionist who advocates for a plant-based diet or even a plant-exclusive uh, diet is ignoring those fundamental facts. They're, they're recommending a diet that is fundamentally deficient in basic nutrients. How can you call yourself a nutritionist if you're advocating for a diet that is devoid of nutrients? How can you say that that's an optimal diet, that that's a good diet or even an appropriate diet for anyone at any stage in life it is, if it is fundamentally deficient in nutrients? 
But the problem is, is they do. A lot of people do, and a lot of these colleges of nutritional sciences advocate for a plant-based diet. So we know it's not how we evolved, and some people would argue, some nutritionists argue, well, that's okay because everyone died when they were 30 anyway. Now we're eating these seed oils, which are so great, they're so good for your heart, and then you can, can live longer. Well, that, that's not true. First of all, they live much longer than we did. We actually know that genetically we're supposed to live 120 years, and yet we're dying in our 60s and 70s. So anybody who, oh, my grandmother lived to 92, she ate a lot of carrots, great. She died 30 years young, you know? And, uh, and the fact of the matter is, is that, that the reason that they died on average in their 30s was because of infant mortality, right? You also can't tell the age of a, of a pre-agriculture skeleton because they don't get arthritis. They don't get decay. They don't lose their teeth. So you look at this and go, like, wow, this is a young, healthy example. They were all like that because they weren't getting the chronic diseases that we got immediately after the agricultural revolution. You started seeing the degradation in the skeletons, arthritis, tooth decay, tooth loss, crooked teeth, small jaws, shorter stature, on average five inches shorter on average, uh, much smaller, shorter femurs, signs of infection, poor wound healing, things like that. So how did we end up with plants being in a healthy diet? Why is that? That's the main point of the talk today, okay? Well, one of the reasons we have these dietetics associations and they argue for, they argue for plant-based diets. They say that the, the healthy benefits of a vegetarian diet and they even say that it was a well-designed vegan diet should be should be the best diet for you. And yet, they recognize, well, you do have to be careful with your B12, D3, K2, vitamin A, uh, iron, and all these other sorts of things. But if you take care of those and you supplement, it should be fine, which is a bit ridiculous for a nutritionist and a nutritional body to suggest that. And they'd also say about the low carbohydrate diet, this is a fad diet, there's no scientific evidence, and yet there are thousands, literally thousands of studies in humans showing the benefits, the medical benefits of a ketogenic diet in humans. And uh, they've actually had to, had to change that recently because now a ketogenic diet is in the national schedule for diabetes treatment in Australia. It's part of, it's part of the guidelines, right? So they had to sort of walk that back. But you, you see the sort of the biases, right? So the problem is, is that the, the DAA, the Dietitians uh, Association of Australia, they are highly compromised. So they basically make no, they, they show no evidence for why a low carbohydrate diet is a fad, but then they say a vegan diet, which is nutritionally devoid, that you know, this is a good diet for these reasons. And they, and they listed previously before they took this down, they listed four uh, studies. Every single one of those studies was actually uh, funded by or written by someone from Sanitarium Foods, someone from the food companies, or someone from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which we'll come to, and that's very important. A lot of these studies, majority of these studies, come from compromised sources. A lot of them will come from, from processed food companies that are trying to push their own agenda. Coca-Cola alone spends 11 times the amount of money on nutritional research every year than the NIH, the National Institutes of Health in America. That's just Coca-Cola. There's Nestle, there's Pepsi, there's Kellogg's, there's Sanitarium, there's all these other sorts of, of food companies. They're all pumping out research. They're all funding research. They're all paying universities to do research. Okay, so the majority of these research studies are biased, or at least potentially biased. And what do they look at? They say, eat more plants, they're good for you. When people eat more plants, then you know, they're healthier. Compared to what, though? They say, well, well, you take away meat, but is that the only thing they took away? Because what they're really comparing it to is a processed food diet where people aren't eating fruits and vegetables, maybe there's some meat in it, like in a bun of a hamburger or something like that, with some trans fats dipped and boiled vegetables, potatoes, and a sugary drink or, artificially, or artificial sweeteners, right? So meat is the, the smallest part of that. So you go away from that and you go to whole food plant-based diet and people improve, I don't, I, I don't doubt it. Okay, but that's not because you got rid of meat. That's because you got rid of all the, the plant-based processed foods. If we go back to our friends at Maasai, <clears throat> they were part of the only study that I know of that actually compared what we're talking about, which is a whole food meat-based diet and a whole food plant-based diet. And that was in 1931, really haven't done anything since then. 
and that was, in, was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And there's a British study, and they looked at the Maasai, and they had a very good example there, because the Maasai are largely eating meat, blood, dairy, and not much else. But their neighbors, the Akikuyu, were almost the polar opposite. They ate a lot of plants. They had a lot of tubers and leaves and seeds and nuts and all these sorts of things. So they were largely plant-based, alive at the same time in the same area. And this is late 1920s, 1930. So this wasn't the, the era of industrial agriculture and crop farming and pesticides and insecticides and fertilizers, all these sorts of things. It's a vegan's dream. They're out on a commune in the middle of Africa, just, eat, just living off the land, right? And, and it was also very interesting because they were genetically similar or near identical because they actually intermarried. And so they would go back and forth. So genetically, they were a very similar population. They ate very different diets. They're, everything else was about the same. So it was a very good, somewhat self-controlled trial. And they looked at them, they looked at their health, they looked at their development, and they found that the Maasai were on average five inches taller, brains were larger, they were 50% stronger, and they were on average 23 pounds heavier of lean body mass. There is no fat on these guys. It's only lean body mass. They had full, well-developed jaws, no tooth decay, big, bright white teeth. They don't have dentists. They don't have teeth whiteners or anything like that. They're eating what they're supposed to eat, and their mouth is working the way it's supposed to work. The opposite was true of the Akikuyu. They were shorter, they were weaker, they were more sickly, they had crooked teeth, decaying teeth, they had vitamin deficiencies, nutrient deficiencies, they were anemic, they were getting infections, they were getting diabetes, they were getting all these problems that the Maasai simply were not. And the British tried to supplement them and say, okay, well, we'll, we'll take care of your, your supplements. This is what the, the dietitians say. Okay, this is a deficient diet, but if you supplement, then you'll be fine. Well, that wasn't fine. They didn't actually improve their health. It wasn't until they replaced the plants with meat that they actually improved their health outcomes. So that's the only study that I'm aware of that actually compares what we're talking about. A meat-based diet, a whole food meat-based diet, and a whole food plant-based diet. The other studies are looking at comparing processed food garbage diet with more plants, right? Because you're comparing it to the norm. That's what they're looking at. You eat more plants and you do better than the average person. The average person is sick. The average person is unhealthy. 93% of Americans uh, have at least one metabolic disease. 70% are overweight or obese. So you don't want to compare yourself to the norm. That's not a good bar to, uh, to put yourself against. So why is the DAA doing this? Well, it starts about 150 years ago, crazy enough, with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is, which is very, very strange. And a lot of this, uh, most of this, is coming from uh, the work of Belinda Fetke, who's the wife of Dr. Gary Fetke, who's a Tasmanian orthopedic surgeon. And she really broke the case open on why, in God's name, we are having this shoved down our throats for so long. That's it. So Ellen G. White was a prophetess. And she had so-called vision from God. And she was told that meat was evil. Meat causes lustful feelings. It increased sexual urges. And of course, lust was a sin. And so therefore, meat was a sin. And it was as bad as smoking and drinking and all these other sorts of substances. And so and it caused you, you, know, <laughs> it caused you to, to feel in a lustful way. And this was bad. She was influenced by Sylvester Graham of Graham Crackers, who also advocated for a bland diet to suppress sexual urges. And this, this was in their writings, specifically was to suppress sexual urges because sex was evil. And, <clears throat> and also for, this was part of the temperance movement as well. So calling about you know, self-vice, which is masturbation. This was thought to be one of the greatest sins you could commit against yourself. And she wrote a book called An Appeal to Mothers where she said that if your child masturbates, it's like putting a gun to his breast and, and pulling the trigger. They're just dead on that instant. And so was, they took this very seriously. And one of, their, uh, one of her uh, little protégés was a guy named John Harvey Kellogg. And he was her typesetter when he was 12 years old and set the type for these books that she was writing. So he was ingrained in this. And he, you might recognize the name, grew up to become Dr. Kellogg. And he and his brother founded Kellogg Cereals. And he invented Kellogg cereals while he was the director of the Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan in order to give food that would suppress sexual urges and desires. That was his mission. He also would see parents who would bring in their children 
who were masturbating, they wanted to stop them. You put them on a vegan diet, put them on a plant-based diet, give them a bunch of these cornflakes in order to suppress their sexual urges. And he would also circumcise them without anesthetic, boys and girls. He would actually cut the clitoris off of girls. And he, or use acid or other caustic substances to scar and score uh, the clitoris and labia to make it painful to them and punish them and to make it painful for them to do it again. And he actually pushed this on the rest of the country. He thought this was a very healthful thing. He, pushed, he convinced the medical establishment in America to push for male circumcision. He tried it for female circumcision, saying this was better for their health. He didn't tell them what his, his actual motives were, which was to uh, suppress and to uh, suppress masturbation. But that's what it was. And so he convinced the medical establishment that it was actually in, in the health of the child's, in, in the best interest of the child, to, uh, to circumcise young boys. And this is why most Americans uh, are circumcised. It's sort of starting to change because people have, have become aware of this more recently. Uh, he tried to do it for women too. He thankfully didn't get, get through with that one. But this is, this is where these people's minds were at. So the Seventh-day Adventist Church has actually set up more than 20 different plant-based food companies. They are, they are the origin of the processed food movement. So Kellogg and his brother founded corn, made cornflakes and, and a lot of other different sorts of cereals that came along with this. There was something like 36 different cereal companies came up around Battle Creek, Michigan during this time because they're all influenced by Kellogg. Kellogg was an extremely influential doctor and scientist in America. He was sort of a doctor to the stars. Uh, you know, back in the 1800s, early 1900s, presidents and movie stars and, and politicians would come to see him at his sanitarium in Battle Creek. And, you know, he was, he was extremely influential. He really pushed his case very hard. He had a lot of very, very strange uh, predilections, like enemas. He always put everyone on enemas. He gave himself two enemas a day. He had a high-powered machine that uh, could pump in 60 liters of water in and out of the rectum uh, <laughs> in, in less than a minute. So he, he would do this. He thought this was part of good health and then being on vegan. So he had, he had very peculiar, uh, very, very unique sort of thoughts. Uh, and so, uh, but he was very influential. And so a lot of other, other uh, cereal companies came up as a result of this. Um, one was Sanitarium Foods here in Australia. It's, it's one of the larger food producers, processed food producers in Australia. They are still owned by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They still uh, benefit from uh, tax exemption status because they're, they're part of a religious organization. And their mission statement is to push a plant-based agenda for this religious ideology. They don't tell you that, but that is what it is. And they say, oh, it's for healthful, this, that, and the other, and blah, blah, No, it's not. It is to stop you from uh, being horny, basically. <laughs> so, <clears throat> How they influenced our diet. Okay, so that, that's the origin of the processed food industry. But they had, they've had so much more influence since then. We know now that they've had undue influence on most of the major dietary guidelines and decision-making processes of the last century. And in fact, it, it gets worse than that because the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics in America was actually founded by the Seventh-day Adventist Church members. So the entire field of nutritional sciences and dietetics was founded by these people who are religiously anti-meat. So it's always been about plant. This is why when I grew up uh, next to a nutritional college, one of the top nutritional colleges in America called Bastyr, everyone coming out of there was just whole food vegan, whole food vegan, whole food vegan. I, I knew that that was insane because like we're, we're apex predators, apex predators definitionally eat animals. And so I knew that that was silly, but I never thought like, wait, how, why and how are PhDs in nutrition being taught that we're supposed to only eat plants when they're deficient in nutrients and we clearly evolved on meat? Now I know why. Because they were founded by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, um, the uh, Adventist Nutritional and Dietetics International Association. These are very influential around the world as well. Loma Linda Medical, uh, Medical School and University. Um, and Medical Center was, again, a Seventh-day Adventist church. When I was applying to medical school back in 2008, I remember I was living in California at the time, and I, I was looking around at the different California schools, and I came across Loma Linda, and I said, okay, who are these guys? I was not even allowed to apply. It says, in order to apply, you must be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist church. You can't even apply. You have to get a letter from your deacon uh, in order to apply. So that's who they are. <clears throat> 
But then you have the McGovern Committee, or the McGovern uh, Report, which was the original attack against fat and meat. This was, this was the first government-sanctioned advice to the public to say, hey, you need to reduce the amount of fat that you're eating. You need to get more healthy grains and vegetables and fruits and things like that. So the problem with that is the, the main author in that report was a Seventh-day Adventist member. Okay? And then we have Nathan Pritikin. Do we, does anybody know who Pritikin is? The Pritikin diet? That was, that, was, that was for decades thought to be the gold standard in uh, heart disease prevention diet. Well, he was a professor at Loma Linda University. I don't know if he was a Seventh-day Adventist member, but he was certainly influenced by them. And he taught at a school that does not allow anybody except Seventh-day Adventists to go there. So he at least had some very strong ties with them. And he uh, read all the books of Ellen G. White which were like dozens. She was just a prolific uh, lunatic of a writer. She just wrote absolutely insane things. Um, and he also testified for the McGovern Committee. These are the people that are pushing forward, you know, the, the food pyramid sort of ideas, right? This is where they came from. They also wrote the first textbook on nutritional science at the university level, okay? So they wrote, they started the, the, the institution they wrote the textbook, they wrote the curriculum, and they have been perpetuating it ever since. That book is still in print in its current edition. That current edition is still being taught. Sally Norton, who people may know, she wrote a book called Toxic Superfoods. It's all about all the different toxins that are in plants. She was a nutritionist. She went to Cornell University, an Ivy League institution in America, and studied nutrition, got a master's, and she was just learning, oh, just eat plants, just eat plants, just eat plants, and she was getting sicker and sicker and sicker until she almost died in her 30s from the amount of toxins that were in these plants that she was eating that were supposedly the most healthy thing that she could eat. That was her textbook. The most recent edition that she was taught in, at Cornell was that textbook, the most recent edition of that textbook. They have been at the ground floor and influencing nutritional thought for 100 years. It gets worse. So now they're, they're invading into the medical sciences as well. So all doctors have been influenced by this. Oh, you'd have to eat less meat, eat less saturated fat. We've all heard this. We all know this. Most of us have been taught this. And most people have pushed it. Most doctors still do push this. But it's gotten worse because and lifestyle medicine was founded by the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 2003, and it was for this direct purpose of pushing a plant-based agenda in medicine. So it sounds good. You want to change your diet. You want to eat right. You want to exercise. Okay? Sounds good. I, I advocate for the same thing. But what they're telling you to eat is more grains, more fruits, more vegetables, less meat. Go vegan start exercising, and you'll be right, and you won't be. So this was founded by the Seventh-day Adventists. They founded the, the, the specialty. They write the exams. They write the curriculum. And they are still running the show. This is, this is all over the world now. In basically every Western country, this is now a specialty having exams. It's lifestyle medicine here in Australia. It's in America. It's in Europe as well. Um, all of these processed food companies have ties to exercises. Medicine, exercises medicine was founded by Coca-Cola. So they're trying to get you away from thinking, oh, what I eat is a problem. I should fix my diet, just exercise. That's the only thing that matters. Calories in, calories out. You know, if you wanna drink a Coke or, or eat a pizza or something like that, it's fine as long as you're moving enough. That's okay. No, it's not okay. You know, is it, is it okay to exercise if you do heroin? Does that just cancel that out? You know, no, there, there are things that you can put in your body that are harmful and you should not put in your body. And they're trying to sell them to you, okay? And unfortunately, uh, even the, the, you know, the DAA here in Australia, they are very much compromised. They have a, a corporate po uh, partnership with Nestle, Kellogg, Sanitarium, and Freedom Foods. And it's in that corporate partnership that they have to push that agenda saying that carbs are healthy, grains are healthy, even sugar is healthy because they sell that. Um, the CEO of the DAA actually personally targeted Dr. Gary Fetke 
in Tasmania because he had the audacity to actually cure his patients of, uh, of diabetes so that he didn't have to amputate their legs. Right? So he was an orthopedic surgeon, he was doing a lot of amputations, and he was the only person that was basically willing to see these poor people and, and do what needed to be done. Everyone else, they just didn't want to deal with it. So he was the only one stepping up to the plate, and he, and he you know, came across uh, low-carb medicine. He saw what it could do for people. He started recommending this to patients, and what do you know? They, they didn't need the amputations that they used to. So he's literally saving people's lives and limbs, saving millions of dollars to the public health care system, and he comes under attack, and he was, he was attacked and abused by APRA for years. And the CEO of the DAA personally called his medical director and said, well, you need to get rid of this guy, he's a problem. All right, and that actually came out. There was, there was uh, minutes from uh, different meetings of the processed food companies and, and, uh, and, and some of these other sort of nutritionists that the low carb down under uh, organization actually came across, and they found that they, they specifically singled out Dr. Fecky by name and said, we need to silence this guy. This is one of those low-carb doctors. Our ser cereal cells are down. We have to take him out. Okay, so these people are militant. They don't care about you. They don't care about nutrition. They care about their bottom line or their religious ideology. So Kellogg's and all processed food companies, they, they unfortunately have uh, some more conflicts of interest as well because they actually are invested in pharmaceuticals as well, okay? So it's not enough that these people want to profit. It's not enough that the, the church thinks that they're helping people by stopping them from masturbating. I mean, I mean how, how's that working? I don't know. But now it seems like they understand that the way that they're teaching people to eat is actually causing harm because they're also investing in pharmaceuticals. And so when I was speaking uh, with Dr. Fecky, we talked about this, and, and there seems to be a very, uh, well, it's just, just quite a devious and diabolical sort of pairing of these companies where they're heavily invested in actually producing you know, blood sugar medications, diabetes medications, and they're also selling things that cause diabetes, right? That, to me, is knowledge of forethought. You're doing something that you know causes harm, and then you're profiting off of that harm. I think that's truly sick. I would hope so, yeah. But, you know, we'll see, we'll see. You know, the, the problem is, is that with the tobacco companies, for decades they lied and said, oh, there's no evidence of that. Look at all these studies. Oh, look at these nice studies. All the studies that they paid for. And these studies say all great things. Well, these studies say that you're full of it. Well, but ugh, we just got these studies. There's conflicting evidence. Who knows what's going on, right? And so that's the stage we're at now. But we actually do know that the food companies and the sugar companies have been involved in, in this sort of work, knowing that their, that their products are harmful. The Sugar Association actually influenced the McGovern Report as well because they paid off three Harvard professors to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as if cholesterol caused heart disease when it was really sugar. And to exonerate sugar and say it was safe, say it was good, and that we should replace our fat calories with sugar calories because they're an empty calorie, they're safe. That's what they said. One of those professors was named head of the USDA, and it was he who authored and published the 1977 declaration saying that cholesterol caused heart disease when it was really sugar, okay? That was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2016. That's not an opinion. That's a historical fact. It's in the peer-reviewed literature, actual internal memos from the sugar companies stating that, stating what they got paid. We know their contracts. They were paid $6,500 in, in, uh, at the time. It's about $50,000 in today's valuation. So you got a, they got a Camry out of the deal, and they just completely screwed the health of the world. Okay? So that's how corrupt this is, and it goes back all the way. So that, that's just talking about Coca-Cola again. You know, the, the majority of spending and funding for nutritional research is coming from the industries who benefit the most by lying to us. That's a clear conflict of interest, and that's something that we need to be aware of, that the studies that don't come from industry show stark contrast. Just like that study with the Messiah in 1931,
that's the only sort of study that we need to look at. We need to look at whole food plant-based diet and a whole food meat-based diet. And then we can see what's the difference between eating plants and eating meat, or eating some plants with whole meat and mostly meat. That's the only study that matters. They don't do those studies because they know what the answer is going to be. This was fun. So people may have seen that. Goldman Sachs asked in a report, is curing patients a sustainable business model? Right? So in that report, they said, well, you know, it's, it's, it's great to think about this. We can take, you know, gene therapy and just cure a disease, and that's wonderful. However, you, you don't get return customers. So is this a good business model? Is this what we should be spending money on actually curing things? Or should we be putting things forward to treat the symptoms perpetually, these chronic disease states, and just treat the symptoms like diabetes, like heart disease, blood pressure, statins. You know, they're trying to put everybody on statins. If a child has high LDL, they want to put them on a statin. That's actually a recommendation now. And that's because it's just like any drug dealer. You know, you hook them early and you get them for life, right? And so that's what they want. They don't want to cure disease, right here. They just said it, they don't want to cure disease. They want to be profitable. So they're not going to help you. Doctors in general are going to try to help you, but they're being influenced by these guys, okay? They don't even realize that they're being influenced by these guys or who they're being influenced by. They don't realize they're being influenced by industry or there's a religious agenda behind it or that there's a financial agenda behind it. They're just, these are the drugs that we have. These are the pills that we have available. And that's great because it gives them a tool in their arsenal to go and, and, and face the world and face these sorts of diseases, not understanding that it's by design that these are never going to fix a problem. We have more medicines, more surgeries, more people working on these problems, and people are getting fatter and sicker and less healthy. And actually, the average life expectancy is starting to come down. Okay? So it's not working. So you need to take control of your own health. You need to understand what you're up against. You need to understand that these people are not going to do it for you. You have to do it yourself. And so, you know, what do you do? You listen to people like, you know, Max and, and uh, everyone that, that's here and understand what is it truly to be healthy, a, a healthy human being biologically. What are we designed to eat? That's what you should eat. Okay, that's the only thing you should eat. Koalas don't eat anything except eucalyptus because other things will kill them. Okay? Why are we eating a whole bunch of random plants? Some of these things didn't even exist. Broccoli is not a real plant. Okay? We hybridized this. Corn is the same thing. These things did not exist all that long ago. Now we have seed oils and all these processed chemical, uh, you know, chemical processes to make these you know, impossible burgers or all these other sorts of things. You look at the ingredients. These things did not exist very recently. Okay? How can something that didn't exist last year be what we're biologically designed for. Okay? We're much older than that. So, we're designed to eat meat. It provides all the nutrition required and nothing harmful that we don't, and that's important because there are other things that cause harm. You want the things that are beneficial to you and you want to exclude the things that are harmful. Smoking, drinking, drugs, plants. Right? Not everybody gets that. <laughs> but. Can we eat any of these plants out there? Make a salad out of that tree? It's a plant, it's a vegetable, it's a leafy green. It's literally green leaves, right? <laughs> so why can't we eat those? If you just get lost in the woods and run out of food, you just eat any random plant, make some fresh garden salads, you know, out of the bush? No, they, they would make you very sick, and we know this. So why don't we know this about spinach? Why don't we understand that for the last 200 years, we've studied the amount of oxalates that are in spinach and how harmful they can be and how all the different people that have died of acute oxalate poisoning from spinach and other sorts of plants. Liam Hemsworth put himself in the hospital after three weeks of spinach smoothies. Massive kidney stones and acute oxalate poisoning. Okay, but no one talks about that. No one talks about the, the normal defense chemicals that are in, inherent in every single plant that can cause harm to varying degrees. And you can get by and you can do okay, but that's like saying, you know, saying that, well, you can eat plants, you can eat vegetables, you can do just fine. That's like saying you can smoke and drink and do just fine because it didn't kill you, right? I, I saw a guy smoking the other day. He didn't die. He didn't drop dead, right? You can do this for decades, but it is over years, over decades that you build up this damage to your body. Your body can deal with a lot. Our bodies are great. They're designed for it. 
But the problem is, is that you can keep damaging yourself and this will build up and you will have problems. And you will get 93% of people being metabolically sick. You will get 70% of people being overweight and obese. Okay, it adds up. And chronic diseases are only on the rise. Why is that? We know that our, our, our primitive counterparts didn't get these diseases until they started eating the things that we ate. So what does that mean? That means that something that we're eating is causing these. And so that's why meat is so important because it provides what you need in the proportion that you need it or else then you wouldn't exist. I wouldn't be here in six years. I haven't eaten a plant. No. So if there was anything I was missing, I'd be very sick. I don't feel sick. All my bloods are great. Okay. And I, it doesn't have anything that is going to harm you. You know, despite what the WHO will tell you about meat. Going back to the WHO, their 2015 report saying that processed meats were a, carcin a carcinogen. Red meat was a likely carcinogen. Well, who was on that report? Who was on that panel? It just happened to be our good friends of Seventh-day Adventists, <laughs> vegans and vegetarians, who cherry-picked studies to make it a, to, to only select ones that showed a very weak association between people who ate meat and a whole bunch of other things because you're doing a survey. How much meat did you eat? How many other things did you eat? These are people that are eating a lot of other things and smoking and drinking and, and, and engaging in reckless behavior. And they were, had a slight increase, very slight increase in their risk of colon cancer, okay? But when you can correct for those confounders and you actually just isolate out the meat, you find no such correlation. And there was a, um, a gentleman, I, I'm blanking on his name, but there was a gentleman who was on that panel and he said it was one of the hardest things that he had to go through in his professional career because he saw time after time after time, high level, high quality, studies showing no connection between meat and cancer, and especially red meat and cancer, being thrown aside and ignored, and other less good quality evidence, like horribly uh, put together uh, studies being used to, to write their decision. And he said to them, you're all vegans and vegetarians and Seventh-day Adventists. You need to report your bias. And they refused. But that's their bias. So unfortunately, our perspective on nutrition has been skewed by a mainstream narrative that started over 150 years ago and has continued to grow over the years. They have extremely wide influence and reach. There's over 22 million members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I know a number of them. They're very nice people. And uh, they all tell me, well, look, most of us are normal, you know, but there are like 5% that are these hardcore, gung-ho, sort of vegan, vegetarian sorts of people. But that is absolutely what is passed down from the top down, this is what you're supposed to eat. You're not supposed to eat meat. You're only supposed to eat plants and all these sorts of things. They're like this, that is 100% true. And they are everywhere. They are on these nutritional boards. They're in the WHO. They're on TikTok, right? And they are uh, in Harvard, or at least influencing people at our major institutions. So Walter Willett is the top nutritional researcher at Harvard. He's extremely influential, extremely well-regarded. He's been on panels with sanitarium, with these food companies, with lifestyle medicine, okay? So I don't know if he's a Seventh-day Adventist, but he's working with them, and he's pushing their agenda, okay? And unfortunately, the proliferation of modern diseases has accelerated dramatically the more of a foothold that these people get. And these chronic diseases were almost non-existent a century ago. They were nearly almost non-existent in the 70s, but they started getting worse and worse and worse, right? In the last 40 years, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, stroke rates, autism, arthritis, autoimmune issues, psychiatric disorders, all these things have increased dramatically. And we have better interventions. We have better medicines. We have better surgeries. We have better knowledge of these diseases. And yet they're getting worse. They're getting more and more prevalent. And some people will say, well, heart disease actually peaked in deaths, like mortality, deaths from heart disease peaked at around the 1960s and 70s and then started coming down right when we started lowering cholesterol. And that's true. Deaths did go down. But first time heart attacks went up. It's just we're surviving them. So heart disease rates are going up. Prevalence is going up. It's more abundant in the population. Incidence is going up. There are more new people every year getting it. There are more new people having a heart attack 
every year, but surviving. Because we can go in and take that clot out. We can go and take the clot out of your brain. We can put in stents. We can do triple bypass, quadruple bypass, quintuple bypass surgery. We can do bypasses in the brain. Okay? We can do amazing things for people. But just because they're surviving doesn't mean that that disease rate is going down. We've reduced red meat, we've reduced saturated fat, we've reduced cholesterol, we've increased fruits and vegetables, we've increased grains. And yet, all of these diseases are getting worse. Okay, so that's clearly wrong. And in fact, I would argue that there's a direct relationship between what we're eating and the diseases that we're getting. Because I don't think that they're chronic diseases. I don't think they're diseases at all. I think that they're a product of malnutrition and toxicity. We're getting a toxic buildup of a species inappropriate diet and a lack of species specific nutrition. Namely, we're eating too many plants that we didn't evolve on that we're not designed to eat and we can't detoxify as safely as we would like and we're not getting enough B12, D3, K2, proteins, fats and all these other sorts of things that are required for our healthy existence. So this thinking originated from and is still influenced by a religious objective that I wasn't aware of until very recently, until I came across uh, Belinda Fetke's work. And I, I encourage everyone here to look her up on YouTube. She, she goes into way more depth than I do. And uh, this is just sort of a teaser on that. And um, you, know, you, you, will, you will never look at a nutritionist the same way again. And if you're a nutritionist, you'll never look at, at yourself the same way again. And, um, and you'll, you'll, you'll just have to ask questions. And that's the important thing, ask questions like, okay, you know, maybe I'll take a look at the evidence for myself and see what I think and not just think what I'm told to think. And of course, there are financial objectives as well. And that's, I, I hopefully made that uh, clear during this presentation, but the, the vast majority of information is being put out there by the exactly wrong people, the people that profit the most from going against our objectives. Our objectives are good health, feeding our kids, feeding our family, growing old, old age gracefully, having our parents not succumb to dementia and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and, uh, and die in a nursing home not knowing who they were, okay? That's what our objectives are, at least most people. That is not their objective. They said it themselves. We're not gonna try and cure diseases. We're gonna try to perpetuate a disease state and then sell you the remedy. So to quote Belinda Fetke, we need a separation of church and plate, all right? To be uninhibited in our eating, uh, our species-specific diet, eating what we're designed to eat, eating what we're supposed to eat, to give ourselves the most health, and not be influenced by other people's agendas. Now, if you want to avoid eating meat for your own reasons, be they religious, ethical, or, or you just think they taste nice, even though they're gross, then you can. That's perfectly fine, but we should be allowed to make that decision and we shouldn't be influenced and told that we should be eating something because it's good for us even though it's bad for us because of someone else's agenda because they want to profit from us they want to sell us some garbage that they just want to make money on they want to make us sick to then sell us the medicine for it if that is their desire or that it's a religious agenda where they think that meat is just evil and we're not supposed to eat it and it's for our own good well thank you i can make my own decisions on that one so thank you very much. I hope that that was um, interesting for people and it, and it sort of opened people's eyes to a new way of looking at this. Thank you very much. So I think, do we have time for any questions? Yeah. So if anybody has any questions, we can, we can pass the mic. I was just thinking then, Vegans, they always say you have to supplement B12, mm -hmm. so they'll concede that, but they will never talk about the others. Why do you think when there's K2, vitamin A, I think it's another 10 essential nutrients that plants don't have, why do they, why will they concede on B12 but don't concede on the others? Well, the thing is that it doesn't matter how much they concede on. B12 is enough, right? You can't get basic nutrition, therefore it's not what our, our bodies are designed to eat. Right, so you, you can just stop them right there. Oh, but all these, doesn't matter, B12, just stop it, just stop the argument. To, to answer your question though, um, again, it, you know, it goes uh, back to those, those, those similar compounds that just aren't quite right. So, oh, there's, there's vitamin K 
and things. There's a lot of vitamin K and kale. And it says that at the grocery store because they're trying to sell it to you, right? It's K1. We can't use K1. We have to, we have, to have K2. We can convert some of it into K2. But they don't know that. They just know vitamin K, right? Um, but it's a very small transfer. And then same with, well, you get, you get all the vitamin A you need from carrots. No, you'd actually have to eat three kilos of carrots a day to get enough, retin uh, get enough uh, beta carotene to make vitamin A if you actually can convert it at all. And fully half of humans cannot do that. Uh, but of course, they don't know that. They, 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 they don't know, you know, because they're, they're pushing an ideology, right? And they hear something good and they just, they just try to run with it. But even, even you know, there's, there's Simon Lewis, who's a, uh, a, a you know, nutritionist over in Sydney, and he wrote a book. There's a whole book, and he's a nutritionist, and none of it covered anything on nutrition except for like the last piece of the book. And he just went over briefly, like, oh yeah, you can sort of get what you need this by eating. This is Simon Hill, not Simon Lewis. Did I say Simon Lewis? Yeah. It's you. Yeah. Yeah. No, so si I'm Simon Hill, sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> So yeah, so so no si Simon Hill, um, you know, wrote this book, and it was all about you know just being vegan and all that sort of. It's exactly all all, all the all the same nonsense that's been going on since eighteen hundreds. You think this is a, a novel book? It's not. It's it's eighteen you know one hundred and fifty years old basically, and uh, and he tries to say, oh, you can you can get this. And you get, and he's saying that you you can convert ALA into DHA and EPA, but he doesn't tell you that it's like less than one percent conversion rate. You know, and so the amounts that you would have to eat, like you would literally explode. And the amount of toxins and nonsense that would come with it are, are just impossible, impossible to get. You can't get these things without supplementation on a vegan diet. You just can't. Um, not everything, not all the time. And um, so it's just impossible. But you don't even need to go that far. Like vitamin B12, can't get it. We're not, we're not meant to eat it. That's not the way. We're not supposed to eat a plant-only diet. Now, maybe you can say mix. Maybe you can say that. I would argue no, that that's not our optimal diet. But you cannot say that a plant-only diet is optimal if it doesn't contain even one nutrient that we need. Even one nutrient, you know, not having enough of one nutrient is still not enough. You have to have an, everything, all the different sort of nutrients in the proportion that you need them. And you know, and, and the list goes on too. So you know, we have have uh, beta carotene and retinol, but there's there are you know, essential or, you know, sometimes non-essential, but sometimes essential amino acids like carnitine. So carnitine only comes from meat. It does not come in any plants, any fungus, anything like that. It only comes in meat. But people say, well, you don't need carnitine because you make carnitine. Uh, you do better with more. We know that from many, many studies. But also only 70% of people actually make carnitine or enough carnitine. So again, it's like the retinol beta carotene issue. 30%, fully 30% of people have to get carnitine from meat. They have to get it. And carnitine has been shown by Texas A&M to actually, uh, deficiency in carnitine during development has been shown to cause autism. And so this is why vegans and vegetarians have much higher rates of children with autism. Because some of those kids can be deficient in their ability to make carnitine. There's a lot of carnitine in red meat. There's some in other meats and dairy but there's a ton in red meat. What's the first thing the vegetarians do is they drop red meat, right? Because they think it's the worst. Well, it's actually the best. And then vegans, they don't have any animal products at all, so they don't get any carnitine, right? And so if their child is deficient or unable, unable to fill that gap, then they're going to develop uh, autism because it's, it's required for uh, neuronal development and for proper mitochondrial function, which we are now understanding is one of the major drivers of chronic diseases and psychiatric disorders and diabetes and cancer is, meta is mitochondrial dysfunction. So, you know, you, the mom may be making enough carnitine that can get through in the breast milk, and as soon as she stops breastfeeding, goes to formula or goes to, you know, plant nonsense, that's when they start displaying symptoms shortly after that. And, and you will see that. That's a, that's a very common timing in the presentation of, of autism is, is, you know, in the months after uh, weaning. Um, this isn't so much a question, but more of a statement concerning the investment of big food and that malice of forethought that you were going on about before. Who's noticed the prevalence of um, cholesterol-lowering wheat bix and low-carb potatoes and all these things creeping in because they know there's a pushback. They know we're pushing. 
but they still want their money grab. So they've got to go, well, okay, well, if I can make a low-carb potato or a low-carb... Low carb potato. There are. Have you not seen them in the supermarket? Yeah. Low-carb low potato. Carb glucose, you know? And who's walked past the wheat bix aisle? Like, I haven't honestly done it for a long time, but... Plant-based wheat bix low-carb... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Low-carb wheat bix and cholesterol-lowering wheat bix mm. So we're feeding you something that's raising, you know, like they're just, they're just using the same old arguments and just churning them over and over and over again. But they're feeling a pushback because, yeah. you know. Well, yeah, and, and, and we have to push back, you know, we, we, have to, we have to make it hurt on their bottom line because, you know, they had, they had these religious ideologies first and foremost, but now they are very much wrapped up in their financial, um, financial desires. So if we, if we hit them in their pocketbook, and, that, and that's why they targeted Gary Fetke, and I'm sure they've got their sights on, on me and others. Uh, is because I mean, Gary Fetke had you know 5,000 people following him on social media, and he, he was just basically telling his patients he was making uh, you know that that this was a beneficial uh, way of eating, and uh, and giving talks on things like low carb down under and, and different conferences. Uh, but he he made he made a big enough impression with them that it was they attributed his uh, his influence on lowering their cereal sales. Yeah. 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 So that's the thing. They, they, yeah. So they're they're losing money, and now they're gonna gonna attack. And now you know keto is being more and more accepted mainstream. So that's why you see so many of these keto this and keto that and low carb, low carb wheat. You know, so like whatever the hell that is, but. You know, and yeah, look, our potatoes is just hilarious. But you know that that's the thing. So uh, we do, we just need to keep hitting them that way. And uh, you know, and that's why you're, you're supporting your local ranchers, supporting people that are making these products. Because if you you vote with your dollar, as was said uh, previously, you know that people are going to pay pay attention to that. You know, people just making noise, no one cares. If you start spending your money differently, that's when they start to care. Thank you, Anthony, for your presentation. It's, mm -hmm. It just sits so well. The, um, I've got leaky gut. Um, soluble CD's 14's high. Um, broccoli sprout powder for sulfurophane. Is there a better form of sulfurophane to actually close my epithelial cells, please? Is, is there a better form of cyanide that doesn't kill you? <laughs> so sulfurophane is, is so toxic that the that the broccoli cannot keep it in its in its natural state. It has two different chemicals. It actually, when you when you uh, macerate it, when you chew it, when it gets crushed, it releases those chemicals and combine into sulfurophane. It's basically a, a, a kill switch, right? So, so it's like you're going to kill me. I'm going to take you with me, right? Same with with cyanide. I use that example specifically because there are 2,500 different plants that have that same kill switch with hydro hydrogen cyanide. And so when you crush like an almond or a bitter almond or a cassava, then it's going to release those chemicals and they're going to combine uh, to, to make hydrogen cy cyanide to poison whatever the hell is eating it. So I would never uh, eat any plant if you want to just, you know, be healthy, but but specifically for, for leaky gut, I would say that, that, that very far away from those sorts of things. Now people say, well, maybe it's hormetic and very low doses. Okay, you know, a prove it, put it in a pill, and and uh, you know, and test it on large populations to see when and how and how much to use. That's what we do with all medications, and yet we're just saying, oh yeah, just just go for it, right? Too much is a bad thing. Probably any is is going to be a bad thing. Uh, time, so you you just need you need to get away from all of those sorts of things that that damage the gut lining, like uh, you know different sorts of vegetables, uh, fiber, and uh, specifically uh, gluten is is very uh, damaging to the gut lining as well. So you can just get rid of that, and you just get rid of all plants and fiber and things like that. It'll, it'll heal on its own. Yeah, and also you won't be introducing things in your body that are going to sneak in through those gaps, and then get in your body and cause a problem. So you're 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 helping yourself on the short term and the long term. Okay, JT, you're next. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's very good to, to hear about the studies on, on the Maasai people, but as far as my knowledge regarding the Maasai over the years, and still the tradition, and they become still very old, 
they eat a lot of meat. Meat is, but also they focus on a lot of honey, and they also focus a lot on their dairy from the animals. So they've yeah. got a lot of milk, and they've got that sour milk type of thing, and then they also make a, a brew from honey and milk uh, type of thing that uh, they use quite a lot over the time. So that's part of the, it's not just the meat only. Yeah. No, no, it's, I mean, it's not just meat, yeah, but, it, yeah, but, but it's, that, it's a whole then, food meat-based diet. Yeah, but and yeah. what I mean, that meat-based, but it's filled on with that yeah. things and that keep them so healthy. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah, and they, they yeah a lot of a lot of dairy, a lot of like the women and children will drink a lot of the dairy, and the the warriors will will mix that with blood or drink the blood uh, directly, and then then eat meat as well. Uh, you no, know, the point is, is is just it's not it's not about only carnivore versus you know whatever. It's just eat, is eating a lot of meat bad for you if it's in a whole meat animal version. And the Messiah are a good example of that. They're eating a whole food meat based diet. Maybe they're eating some other things, but they're predominant they're eating a lot of meat and you're comparing that to a whole food plant-based diet that is not eating a lot of meat and what are the differences you know and there's stark differences and so that's the thing what what all of these other nutritional studies are trying to show is that that meat is bad you shouldn't eat meat you should eat fruits and vegetables when you say when you eat more fruits and vegetables people automatically think you're eating that instead of meat right that's not the case you're eating it instead of processed garbage and if you're eating it instead of meat you will have poor health outcomes just like the akikuyu Cindy. So there's a gentleman at New York University and his name's, I think, Matthew Tao, and he's a um, professor of bioethics and he wants to create um, people, he, wa he wants the human race to become allergic to meat. They know they can do it with a tick. I've seen that guy. Yeah, yeah. WEF guy. So that's kind of scary. When this agenda has been happening, to this point, you know, what happens then? You know, like, I just want to know, do people understand the agenda is so big that yeah. this is what they want to do? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's, all, it's all wrapped up in, in weird political sort of, uh, you know, things. I mean, this is, this is why you're saying that, you know, cows are horrible. You know, there was a, there was a video that just went out, that went sort of viral uh, with the, an aerial f footage of Kuwait where they're burning seven million tires Every year it's just these big black clouds and it's just like it's just like okay, we're doing that and we're blaming cows you know people went on the farm tour i mean did that look like just a polluted mess and hellhole cesspit no it was this is a very very healthy wonderful uh you know glade it was it was exactly what it was supposed to be and so you know people people need a bit more common sense but unfortunately they're being inundated with this sort of thing and you get those people i mean he could be very well meaning oh my god this is so important we got to get rid of this or he could be absolutely wrapped up in these sorts of agendas and being being paid to say these things or 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 you know involved in the seventh day adventist church or at least influenced by them indirectly it's uh it's it's you know, it, it just goes so far and wide, you just really can't trust anybody. You just have to sort of look at, you know, what are we designed to eat? That's what I should eat, okay? What is the, what is the environment? Is plants and animals living in a symbiotic relationship? Right, how does that work? So, you know, you, you take that out and you just go to crop farming, crop agriculture, industrial processes, those things are, are devoid of nature by definition, right? Any industrial process is, is not natural and it's not mimicking nature either. So they're, they're making the argument from an environmental and ethical standpoint, but in fact, they're doing the exact opposite of what you're supposed to do, right? They're saying we need to save the environment by doing all these things. You know, we need to save nature by doing things that are wholly unnatural. And these natural processes have been going on you know, throughout the entire history of the world, those are now somehow bad, even though they weren't before we got there. I mean, it's, it's a bit silly, but yeah, you're right. It, I mean, that's, that's why you have to really fight and not, not give an inch on any of these sorts of things. Because if you, if you end up in a society that the rulers and powers that be get to decide that they can just inoculate everyone here with something that makes them allergic to meat, you know, that, that's, that's nowhere you ever want to live because that is not where it's going to stop. So. Um, hi, sorry, I'm over here. Oh. Oh. Okay. Hi, um, thanks for coming all the way over from Perth as well. It's a long flight. I kind of have two questions. One of them should be pretty quickly. I've got a younger brother. He's about, oh, he got diagnosed when he was about, how old was he? 14? 
13 with Crohn's. It's, he, I think he was one of the youngest to be diagnosed in Queensland. Um, he gets, obviously, he goes in, oh, he gets really bad episodes of it. I saw on your Instagram you posted someone who was able to, was it in remission, um, just going purely carnival. I guess it kind of goes off his, is it just time that gets there or is there anything that he can, I, I guess, like speed up the recovery of, like if he was to go full carnival? Because every doctor he goes to is high fiber, very low no. meat. Yeah. And like, and, and, and that's against the, that's against the literature as well. That has nothing to do with carnivore. That's just that's just flat out against the literature. So the quickest thing, and this is clinically proven, the clinic quickest way he can resolve his Crohn's is by stopping to eat all those nonsensical things. So there was a study in Crohn's looking at an elemental diet, which is highly processed. It's just you know it's this tub of you know protein powder basically, but it has all the sort of macro and micronutrients that you need. It doesn't have anything else. Okay, putting people on that and just avoiding eating all those other things was a better treatment and intervention for an acute flare-up of Crohn's than prednisolone. Are you we, talking about those poppers? No, I'm just, well, an elemental diet is, uh, is, is basically just your nutrients, just getting the nutrients that you need. And you can get this in sort of shake form. Mm. And, uh, and so it's just, you just sort of pour out this powder and, and put it in to shake. But it's like, it's, it's um, you know, you wouldn't just get it at the store, you know? Um, and most people don't even know that this stuff exists. But what, what is an essential diet? What is the, you know, uh, that, that extreme elimination diet where you're only getting nutrients? It's, it's this steak, right? So you're just getting the nutrients that you need in the proportion that you need them. You're not getting anything else. And so it's the elimination of all those other things that is causing the Crohn's. And so it's a better treatment for Crohn's, clinically proven in humans, to just stop eating all that garbage than prednisolone, which is the gold standard on any of these sorts of flare-ups, which obviously has huge ramifications and side effects, as, as uh, you know, Jacob was talking about. He wanted a steroid shot. So that's what prednisolone is. It's a, it's a dose of steroids to just calm down, just basically suppress your immune system and, and stop this from happening. Just stopping eating that garbage works better than steroids. So there really is nothing quicker than that. You know, you're, 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 you stop introducing the thing that is perpetuating the problem and the body heals and the body will heal. I, I generally see people, if they go pure red meat and water, and it, it's very important because, you know, as common theme here, you know, it matters what you eat, even with meat. And so people that are eating chicken and pork and farmed fish that are fed the wrong things, you know, some of those things get into the meat and it gets into them. And so some people actually respond very poor, they respond worse to plants, but even like pork and chicken and fish that are factory farmed. Uh, they can cause reactions as well. So most people with autoimmune issues do the best on red meat and water, grass-fed and finished, but it, it, even just grain-finished is fine uh, if it's red meat for most people, most, most autoimmune sufferers. There was another study um, in the literature looking at uh, just eliminating out fiber and carbs from the diet for people with Crohn's and and see how long they could stay in remission without medication. It was up to 51 months, which is over four years without medication. It's just, just eliminating carbs and fiber. So there's something in the carbs and the fiber or something that come along with the carbs and fiber that is causing the Crohn's, right? Contrast that with a control group that didn't remove carbs and fiber. They stayed in remission on average zero months without medication. It's not a lot of months, yeah. right? So that's clinically proven. Now you can, you can sort of translate that over to a carnivore diet because a carnivore diet is an elemental diet. It's only giving you the elemental things that you need and nothing else, right? And you're removing carbs, you're removing fiber. So his doctor saying you need to eat more fiber is, is strictly going against the literature for Crohn's disease specifically. And I, I have never seen someone with Crohn's ulcerative colitis or, any, or really any other autoimmune issue that did not resolve or, or at least significantly improve went on a strict red meat and water diet. So if he goes on that, on a, on a strict red meat and water diet and nothing else, then he will significantly improve in the coming weeks, probably in about three weeks to a month. He'll probably have no symptoms. In three months, I would, I would bet you that he would have no sign on biopsy. Okay, thank yeah, you. No problem. Um, sorry. Yeah. Just one more. Um, mm -hmm. This is actually my partner's question, but I'll, I'll answer it. I'll ask it. He's, he loves playing sport, being an athlete. One of the biggest questions he always asks is what about carbohydrate? You know, before a big game, obviously you being an athlete, I thought that you might be able to touch on this. Yeah, so I mean, I, I played, I played uh, high level rugby for five years on a carnivore diet, eating no carbohydrates, and that was when I was physically at my peak ever. 
in my life, except for right now. Uh, and now, unfortunately, I have <laughs> screwed up knees, so I can't, <laughs> I can't keep playing. Um, but w between 20 and 25, I was, you know, sort of the highest levels of, of American and, and Canadian rugby, and I played in, in England as well. And I was on a pure carnivore diet. I couldn't get tired. I couldn't run out of energy. I couldn't wear myself out. Could not. The hard, I could not work hard enough to push my, to, to, to wear myself out. It took a while to get up to that. You do have to, you know, get fit. But I was, right away, I was already at a different level. When I was 38 and I came back to a carnivore diet, uh, two weeks into it, I just felt so much, I was way overweight and excess fat, hadn't, hadn't really worked out in months, really, because I was, I was in Bangladesh doing humanitarian work, hadn't played a full rugby season in three years. And so I was very much out of shape, but I felt so good. It was like, right, I'm going back to play some rugby. And I went back into my, uh, my team in Seattle, called the Seattle Saracens, then turned into the Seawolves, and that year they turned professional, uh, you know, really, really professional. Before that, it was just the top league, but you just, you just weren't getting paid for it. And, and I was out there with these professional athletes, and they're attracting you know, big pros from all over the world now. And me having done nothing, that was the first time I'd run really in a year, uh, I was able to just be step for step with all these guys who had been training for the last few months that I had been in Bangladesh. And two weeks into, pre into training, we did a modified bleep test, you know, the, the conditioning test for the team. I came in top five out of 92 people with two weeks of training. It was all diet, and I was fat, right? So, you know, and it, it, it's, it's unreal. So the, I, I do a lot of posts about this, and I do, I do a video called, you know, high-performance training on on carnivore, uh, but the biochemistry is very clear. When you stop eating carbohydrates, you make all the carbohydrates, glucose, glycogen, ketones that you need, and you have, a, you have an unlimited source and supply because you have over 10 times the amount of energy, even on a, on a skinny person that doesn't have all that tofi fat, you know, just a, a, a slim person, you have 10 times the amount of energy in your fat supply than you will in your, your glycogen. And when your insulin is up and you're eating carbohydrates, your, your glycogen cuts off and you cannot replenish it. You have to eat more sugar. You have to take those you know, slurpy sticks of sugar and things like that. You can't, you can't do anything else, right? So, but when you're on a carnivore diet and you're, you're fat adapted, keto adapted, then you will, you will just constantly replenish your glycogen and your ketones uh, from your fat stores. We know this from, from studies in wolves in 1981. They said, they, oh, you know, you, know, they, you, know, you need carbs to burn carbs, but wolves don't carbo load before they chase caribou for 10 hours. You know, so what the hell do they do? Do they have glycogen? Do they have blood sugar? And they found out, yes, they do. And it's rock solid. It doesn't move. Because the second they use it, they replenish it, right? And we actually know this in, in athletes from the work of uh, Professor Tim Noakes in South Africa. He's, he's one of the, the best top uh, nutritional scientists and doctors and sports medicine doctors in the world. For decades, he was pushing carbohydrates. About 10 years ago, he went, oof, got that one wrong, really sorry. And he's been doing his mea culpa ever since, saying, hey guys, I, I've been lying to you for 30 years, I'm really sorry, this is wrong. You don't need carbs, in fact, you're better off without them. And he's been showing in randomized clinical trials in humans that you get the exact same output with or without carbohydrates, but the difference being is that you can keep going without the carbohydrates, because you can keep tapping into your fat stores. But you get the same output, right? But you never stop. And then he switched the groups, one and, and fed the keto group carbs and, and uh, switched the carb group to keto, brought them back in 42 days. They said that that was overkill, but 42 days just to make sure that they were keto adapted. Again, they both had the same output, right? So no, you don't need carbs. In fact, I would, I would say you don't want them. Foz, you're up. Um, two words, coffee, question mark. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> So, yeah, so for, so for me, I, I, I sort of go by, by the principle of, you know, all plants have some sort of defense chemical. That's their nature. All living things uh, have a defense, right? It's kill or be killed for plants as well as animals. These trees are out there. They exist. Why is that? There are bugs, there are insects, there are birds, there are animals. Why aren't they just completely destroyed and, and eaten to extinction? The, the reason is because they are absolutely not defenseless. And they, the majority of their, of their defenses are chemical in nature. And so all plants are gonna have defense chemicals and we have been living basically as carnivores or hyper carnivores, meaning we get the vast majority of our nutrition from meat for the last two, three million years. And then some. So we've been out of that, 
evolutionary race. You know, plants and animals are an evolutionary arms race. Plants becoming more and more poisonous so less and less animals can eat them so they can survive and thrive. And then animals becoming more and more adapted to specific poisons in specific plants so they can eat that plant and survive and thrive. Uh, but they don't eat other things. That's why koalas eat eucalyptus. Almost nothing else use, eats eucalyptus, but they don't eat anything else, right? And this is why 70% of animals are carnivores. They eat other animals because it's really difficult to contend with those toxins and actually turn plant tissue into animal tissue. So based on those principles, I don't eat, I, I have three hard rules for myself, which is no plants or fungus, no sugar or any sweeteners, nothing artificial, and that goes for sauces, seasonings, and drinks as well. So my you know, paradigm is, is, is such that, you know, say, okay, well, what about tea or coffee? It's a plant, so I don't touch it. Well, what about honey that comes from an animal, okay, well, it's sugar, first of all, and second of all, it's not of an animal, it's just from an animal, it's really bee vomit, right? So it's, I'm sorry if this hurts your business on the, on the honey farm, but, um, but, but I think of it sort of as cud, right? You know, I mean, that, that's, that's partially digested and it's very nutritious and broken down for a cow, and it would be better, sort of like kimchi or some sort of fermented sort of uh, plants or something like that would be better for us, but it's still not food for us. It's food for a bee. It has some things that are good for you, but it also has a bunch of sugar and other sorts of things. So that's how I think about, the, uh, about those sorts of things. But, you know, I, I think that the main thing is just eating a lot more meat, not being afraid of meat, not thinking this is a bad thing for us because we know that that was bullshit. Right? So meat's not bad for you. Animal fat's not bad for you. It's actually essential. It's essential that we eat meat and eat fat, okay? So I think you just eat more fatty meat and try to avoid certainly processed foods, sugars, uh, processed carbs, any carbs really, and alcohol and all these sorts of things. That's the main thing. And the more meat you eat, that's gonna replace out all these other things. So the more meat you eat and the less other things, plants and things like that, you, you will be healthier. Some people really need to be bare bones, just meat and water, and they, they can't even do coffee. I, I spoke to a gentleman. Uh, first of all, you know, caffeine is a neurotoxin. It was developed by plants as a neurotoxin insecticide to fry the brains of insects when they try to eat it, right? And a coffee bean is a bean. That's a seed. That's a plant's baby. And plants protect their babies more than anything. And the seeds and beans and nuts and legumes, that's generally where you'll find the highest concentration of poisons. And it goes for coffee as well. So you have to roast them. That's try to, to denature some of these, these toxins. But caffeine itself is a toxin. But it also has 150,000 other chemicals in it as well. So you'll find that if you just take a caffeine pill, you'll feel better than if you drank a cup of coffee because it's very pro-inflammatory. It has oxalates, uh, phytic acid, tannins, and all these other sorts of things that, that are going to sort of mess with your system. There are a lot of people that they still drink coffee and they do very, very well, but a lot more people, when they ditch coffee, they feel better. And I had, you know, it, it's been in the clinical literature for 100 years that putting people on a ketogenic diet is a very good treatment modality for uh, epilepsy. And I had a gentleman uh, who I spoke to who went keto and it helped reduce the amount of seizures, but it didn't get rid of them. He went carnivore, that completely eliminated them. And then he had coffee and he had a seizure. So he's just like, this is a neurotoxin. I'm not going to touch this stuff. But, you know, most people do fine with it. And I think, you know, if, if you like it and you enjoy it, that's fine. But, you know, I would, I would encourage people just to try, try without for a month. Just try just meat and water for a month. See how you feel. You add coffee back in and it doesn't, doesn't damage you, doesn't bother you. You know, go for it. For me, it did. You know, like when I, I don't get sore anymore. It doesn't matter how hard I work out. It doesn't matter the gap in between workouts. I do not get sore. And that's because... It's really those inflammatory factors in plants that are causing that pain, stiffness, and swelling. And, you know, and that's the plant's way of telling you to go away. Don't eat me, I'm gonna make you sick, I'm gonna make you hurt, right? And so I had one cup of coffee and all of a sudden I was sore for two days. I'm like, nope, not doing that again. You know, so, so for me, I don't wanna do it. But you know, a lot of people do, but as long as you're eating a lot more meat, not being afraid of the fat, and, and being cognizant of, of what plants can entail for you. I do, I do a whole, <laughs> presentation and lecture if people haven't seen it on uh, at, a, at a medical seminar called plants are trying to kill you it's very straightforward I'm not I'm not you know, I'm not pulling punches they, they're just that's what they're there for they're there for themselves and not for you doctor uh, now that you've destroyed my honey chicken <laughs> and pork enterprises I want to claw back a little bit of ground if I can no but no but the thing is the thing is is that is that your your meat production is exactly what people should be eating you know what i mean it's 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 the factory farm sort of stuff that that people seem to have a problem with but like the the actual like sort of 
you know, range pasture fed animals don't have nearly the problem. Or people don't nearly have the problems with those. My, my question is actually about marbling uh, in beef and red meat. But before we get to that, I haven't heard you talk about eggs. Pro eggs? Yeah, yeah, eggs are great. Pro yeah, eggs, fantastic. great. Thank you. I'd sell eggs too. <laughs> We're up. Now, so I get asked about well, when I do my tours and I've, 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 I've caused a little bit of trouble on Instagram with Dr. Pran Yoga Nathan um, dumping on the Wagyu crew. Uh, and I get asked about it all the time. So I'd love to hear your opinion. Intramuscular fat in red meat, marbling. You know, there's, there's, it's been a big marketing push. Uh, fat is flavor, uh, red meat people know that. But you look at the footage here of uh, the MRIs in humans and you're like, marbling is a sick human. It's a, it's a, it's a human with disease. And th the way you get marbling in animals is a, is a few, in ruminants is a few different ways. Uh, one, you can genetically select, select for that predisposition and um, you know, exacerbate it. Uh, the second way is you finish them in, with grain. And the third way that I've, I've realized is the older animals have more marbling, maybe as muscles deteriorating as they age or something. So I'd, I'd love to know your opinion about higher marbled red meat. Yeah, well, well certainly the ones that are, that are marbled in, in such a way that you're, you're causing them to be metabolically sick, I don't think is a, is a great idea. Now, if we're talking about the difference between having you know a wagyu steak or or a marbled steak and uh, you know a carrot like i would say go for the wagyu steak you know it's going to have a lot of the nutrients that you need people do very well on them but it's, it's not nearly as good as like grass fed grass fed especially like the regeneratively raised sorts of things i mean i'm not i'm not doing this as a, as a as a commercial plug it's just a fact when you regeneratively raise animals you don't just like just stick them out there to their own devices when you move them around the soil becomes more healthy, the grass becomes more nutrient dense, and then the animals are eating more nutrient dense food, and so they're more nutrient dense as well. And so you'll have a, a, a massive increase. And I've spoken to uh, a couple of regenerative farmers in America, and they said that the micronutrients are four to five times higher in their beef than, than standard beef. And so it, it makes an objective difference. So another objective difference is that when you grain finish a cow and get that marbling, that you, you lose out on some of the omega-3s. And so there was a study that, that uh, suggested that after about three months in a feedlot, uh, beef lost all of its omega-3s. And there's only omega-6s after that. So you need omega, you need DHA and EPA, you need specific omega-3s, ALA doesn't cut it. And so you, know, you, you do need to get this from your meat. So if you're only eating you know, grain-finished beef, then you probably need a, an omega-3 source uh, on top of that. Some people have problems with folate. Most people don't, but some people have an like MTHFR gene and they uh, don't, don't process folate properly. So you need a bit more. So adding in a bit of liver or something like that is important for those people. Most people don't need it. But yeah, there, there's definitely a difference uh, when, you're, when you're marbling these things because you're making them metabolically sick. This is a sick cow. Uh, Dr. Sean O'Mara, who, who uh, Dr. Um, Colhane mentioned, uh, he won't eat that. He won't, he won't eat um, grain finished beef. He's like, that's, a, that's meat from a sick cow, I'm not gonna eat it. But I think of it sort of as, as like the Olympics, you know? So um, silver medalists being the, the grass, grain finished, you know, lost to the gold medalists, right? And so that sucks. However, they also beat everybody else on earth. So if you, if you don't have access, if you don't live near uh, you know, Jacob or you don't have access or you don't have the, the means to, to afford that sort of meat because it, it, is, it can be more expensive, um, it's still better than anything else. And so uh, I, I, would, I would aim to get you know, the gold standard, the gold medal, but if, if you can't for whatever reason, it's still very good for you. I've question that leads on from that over here you want to look at me <laughs> i was out at jake's yesterday getting his my beet and my steak and i looked at one that was marbled a little bit and one that wasn't so i want you to tell me which was a, so this is all things equal from jake walkie's farm and well, one was marbled more than the other and i sat there thinking uh yes no yes no i want more fat i actually chose the marbled one mm. i'm just wondering if all things were equal it's in jake's butchery which is well, the most healthy. If, if it's in Jake's book, butchery, and that that's presumably going to be like an older cow or one that's just genetically designed to have that, because it's not going to be have that that marbling exacerbated by a feedlot, because he doesn't use feedlots, right? Should be fine. Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, and, and, and older cows are amazing. Like I don't know if anybody's had like an older cow. They taste 
so much better. And yes, fat is flavor, but you know, generally older, you know, grass-fed finished cows, they're they're leaner, they have more they have more subcutaneous fat potentially, but they don't have the intramuscular fat. They taste amazing and they have much more beefy rich flavor that's that's absolutely fantastic so if, you, if people haven't tried those and they can get their hands on it I, I highly recommend it it's also going to have a higher concentration of nutrients so just have more time to lay down and enrich their own tissue with nutrients so it's better for you too uh, Anthony we've got another one over here hi uh, do you worry about mTOR or think about it no <laughs> so the thing is I mean mTOR is, is, is extremely complicated right but um you know, the, the thing is, is you have trillions of cells, trillions upon trillions of cells. They have, you know, trillions of interactions and chemical interactions inside of each of those cells every second. So, you know, trying to figure out one chemical process is, is, is going to be difficult, you know, because it's in such a complex system. And so we can figure out a lot of things, and, and we do, but a lot of these things are just gleaned information, it's just sort of associations and could potentially, because mTOR goes on and off for different reasons at different times, and there, there's other factors that go, uh, go along with mTOR that if those are off or on, or a combination thereof between those two, and mTOR is on or off, it, it does very different things metabolically. So there are a lot of combinations of things that can happen in your body. And so mTOR being on or off isn't necessarily a good or a bad thing unless it's unless you look at it in the context of those other biochemical processes that are going on so it's very hard to do that it's very hard to know what to do but the one thing you can do is what are we biologically designed to do right so if you, if you live that way you know the idea of a paleo diet is what, what is paleolithic man eating what were people eating a hundred thousand years ago and uh, what are they designed to eat you know that's what we should be eating what that really is is a carnivore diet that's what people were eating and so Native Americans in the 1800s, I was, I was speaking about this earlier, um, they were shown to be in a study, the tallest human beings alive on Earth. The average height of a population is denotes the average health of a population. So, oh, well, they, they only lived 30 years. That's not true. By their own records, they were living well over 100 years, 115, 120, 130 years. The longest self-reported uh, Native American was 137 years, Chief uh, White Wolf. Yeah, Chief John Smith White Wolf. And people said, oh, well, you know, he was just lying. Maybe. But he described fighting in the War of 1812, and he died in the 1920s. It's a long time, you know? And, and, he, and he descriptively described it. And his family all said, no, no, he was, he was 137. And we know genetically we're supposed to live 120 years based on our telomere length. That's how long we're supposed to live on average. So if you just do what you're biologically designed to do and just stay out of your own way and just let your body get on with it, you should live 120 years without doing anything special, without worrying about mTOR, without taking any supplements or you know, doing any sort of, you know, taking any special drugs from you know, David Sinclair or anybody else. You, know, you, you should make it to 120, just, just on your own. And so I don't, I don't worry too much about mTOR because I don't think whatever mTOR is doing in my body, it's not supposed to be doing. I'm, doing, I'm giving my body the inputs that it needs, and so it's going to respond accordingly. I'm, I'm very convinced of that. And when, you, and when you look at the longevity of these native populations, you have to, you have to trust their records and their, you know, them saying it, which you may not want to do. I, I'm happy to because it happens again and again and again and again and again all over the world for thousands of years, and it's always around that 120 mark. And we know as geneticists, we're supposed to live to 120, right? If you die before 120, something killed you, okay? That's what that means. And so everyone that you know that did not make it to 120, something killed them prematurely, okay? And uh, that's, that's everyone, right? So, you know, mTOR is very important. It's absolutely important, but it's a very complex system, and all the best that we can say is if you if you give your body the biological inputs that it, it requires for its design, then it's then mTOR is going to work exactly the way it's supposed to. Excellent. Okay. Hope that helps. Anyway, <laughs> all right, uh, we'll have one more, and then I'm conscious that Dr. Shafi has to jump on a plane back to to Perth. Ben, do you want to ask a quick question? Yes, it is a quick one. Um, uh, I've been carnivore for six years, uh, and just on the coffee topic, um, the first four years of that, I was drinking coffee every morning, um, and when I was in Prague two years ago, I realized the insanity 
of what I was actually doing. I was a slave to this bean, and everywhere I went in the world, I was trying to look for the bean, but not, on a, not only any bean, but the organic bean, and the less toxic bean, and the non-sprayed bean. Um, and all the bean was really doing was making me want more bean, but you know, also, also uh, making me anxious, not sleeping properly, uh, giving me headaches. Uh, and when I quit it, I just found my sleep was an amazing and no stress. You don't feel anxious all day and like on edge. Um, well, the decaf still had the same effects. I don't know why, but I still didn't feel quite right. Because um, all that does is remove the caffeine and you've still got a lot of toxins in there. But my question is, because it's a plant food and Nescafe is one of the biggest distributors of ca coffee, which is a one of those big food companies. Do you think they're also trying to push coffee because it's the world's most popular drink? How did it get to that point? Do you know any sort of mm. background there? Or? No, I, I don't. I don't know the background on coffee except there's a drug. It's addictive, and you know, yeah. food companies love drugs, and that's why there's sugar in everything, mm. right? So this is this is like the opium trade, you know. Historically, yeah. people made made fortunes and empires based on opium, and now they're doing it on sugar and and tobacco and alcohol and, and uh, coffee and things like that. So uh, people like drugs. That's, that's why people like to sell them drugs because they, they have steady customers, you know? Um, so I don't, I don't know if that, that wraps up. I mean, Nestle is, is um, you know, they're, they're, they do pretty, pretty nasty things, you know, um, as, a, as a rule in their business model. But, you know, I, I, I think that's, from what I understand, that's, that's more to do with, with profit motives. Uh, because the Seventh Day Adventist Church is, is is actually against things like coffee and caffeine and and cigarettes. So they they, they I don't disagree with everything they say. You know, uh, it was just the meat one they got wrong, right? So it was like no no coffee, caffeine, alcohol, cigarettes, all these sorts of things, and meat. They lump meat in with all of that, right? So I think that's that was just the fundamental flaw. Everything else I think is 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 pretty good as far as their ideas, eating, living a clean life. Family oriented, you know, not doing drugs, alcohol, not the idea of not putting bad things into your body, but they got one massive mistake there, which is, you know, meat is the only thing that's that's healthy for us to eat, and all these other things that they replace that with are actually quite harmful. So they got that one fundamentally wrong, and of course their tactics are just completely uh, out of out of bounds. I mean, it's just criminal sort of things, you know, pushing your agenda on people like that without their knowledge. Like that, like they just messed up and got it wrong. Well, I think Ellen G. White's a liar. Yeah, I don't think she like had a vision from God. No, <laughs> like no, she was a plagiarist. Yeah, she 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 like like hundreds of her visions and things like that were actually uh, uh, you know just directly taken from other you know like prophets and religious holy people and popes and things like that. It's just they you know, people didn't know. So she's reading all these things. Oh, I had a vision from God. It told me what you know Pope Benedict the second in 1640 said, but you don't know that. So. I'm just going to look how, how cool I am. No, she was a plagiarist. I, I, I fully believe that she uh, was just a fraud and just a, a huckster. And she just, you know, and she just made her name by this. You know, there were, there were other sorts of accounts of different Seventh-day Adventists. They basically said that, that a, a vegan diet was a way to, to sort of make their presence as, a, as a, their own religion known, that this was their own unique thing and that, um, I forget the, exactly who said it, but they, they basically said that, that this uh, diet could be also thought of as, as, a, as a religious you know, um, identity and help forge the image of the Seventh-day Adventist church more than anything. So I think that that was largely to do with what it was. Now, she could have believed that this helped suppress your hormones. I mean, it, I mean, it does. It suppresses your hormones. It makes you unhealthy. And so, you know, you're not going to be, you're not going to have the same sexual urges if you're unhealthy, you know, because your body's telling you, look, you can't, you can't procreate. You're not going to be able to support kids. You know, you don't have the resources. You don't have the health, you know? And so, yeah, it can absolutely do that. So, but, but her motivations were just different. It wasn't for proper health. Her motivation was to suppress sexual desire. And she got that. Not no, 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 not a mistake. No, she's, she's horrible. All right. Thank you very much, Anthony. That was fantastic. All right. Thank you, everyone.